We've all experienced seasons in life that we never saw coming. Moments in time that felt unbearable. Becoming the main character in a drama we never wished for. Living a story we never imagined ourselves telling. My story started with a girl who became my wife, an old SWAT bus that became our home, and a dream to travel that became a reality and our ticket to freedom. We called ourselves borderless and we documented every moment in our pursuit to chase this new kind of lifestyle on the open road. That chase led us down paths that we never could have imagined, from the white sands of New Mexico to the back roads of Florida, and even around the world to places like Costa Rica and Iceland. But when the world closed down, our wings were clipped and we found ourselves at a crossroads once again. Except this time, our paths forward didn't look the same. It's been said that in this life, there will be storms. Dark times with turbulent conditions that challenge and test our resolve. It's impossible to know how long it will last or the impact it will leave. Your only protection is your own grit and determination and to hold on tight to the promise of the future, the calm after the storm. Because just like every dark night turns into day, every storm runs out of rain. And afterwards, the world is a little bit different, but so are we. So this is the story of the aftermath. The traveling home has been sold, the marriage has ended, but the dream remains. Stronger, brighter, and with more fire than ever. This is the story of one guy's conviction to chase after a dream a second chance for a solo traveler to take on the world once again. This is Becoming Borderless. On this season of Becoming Borderless, I'm back on the road searching out new places to explore, new ways to create, and to learn as much as I possibly can. But this time, I'm not doing it alone. I'm traveling across the country to link up with other nomads chasing the same dreams as me. From exploring their rigs to unveiling their lifestyles, each traveler shows me what their pursuit of borderless looks like. So if we haven't met, my name is Adam. I'm an aspiring filmmaker, a photographer, a bit of an adventurer, and most recently, a nomad. From my first trip overseas, I discovered what makes me feel the most alive is the sense of awe and wonder. Cameras help me capture and interpret the world around me. They reveal new details, reframe my perspective, and help me process the complexity of life. The more I traveled, the more I discovered that other cultures around the world have learned to keep life simple. Their wealth comes not from material possessions, but in the way that they live. They eat well, they stay active, and they're deeply engaged in the community around them. I believe that we are living in the best time in human history. It's not without its problems and it's far from perfect, but the gap between primitive survival skills and modern entertainment to suppress boredom grows exponentially each year. But where humanity flourishes, the individual stagnates. We indulge in endless creature comforts that cultivate a cycle of self-interest. We suffer from laziness, decision fatigue, dependency issues, bad habits, and the social pressure of keeping up with the Joneses. Without making the conscious choice about where you want your path to end up in the future, life can oftentimes sweep us along and we find ourselves in places we never planned to be. So a few years ago, I chose to act on the lessons I'd learned from creating and traveling to keep life simple trading the traditional life for one of freedom and exploration, to choose experiences over possessions. So I set out to live a nomadic existence. A nomad is a person who lives in a tiny home attached to four wheels and travels the open roads. We chase good weather and we spend our time exploring new places. Nomadic living ranges from RVs and motor homes, camper trucks and pull behinds, to even the DIY converted van or school bus. School bus conversions are also known as schoolies, and this was my first tiny home. I spent a year transforming an old SWAT bus into a fully functional off-grid tiny home. From solar to plumbing, to insulation and carpentry, and even heating and air, this bus had it all, except for a good engine. It had its first major breakdown and a series of major breakdowns in only three months. Eventually, I sold the bus and I transitioned to an RV, 
I stripped it down to its bare bones, remodeled it, gave it a much needed facelift, and a few short months later, I was back on the road. And a few short months after that, the pandemic hit. It felt like a string of bad luck that was almost comical. Through both building processes, I discovered a love for design and building with my hands. But right now, the most important thing is not the custom look or the design, but rather getting back out on the road as soon as possible to continue the adventure. So this time I'm going with something a little smaller and something that's already road ready. This is my new van and I'm calling it John Bird, only because it makes me laugh. This is a Winnebago motorhome built inside of a Ram Pro Master van. It's easy to drive at only 21 feet and has plenty of living space. I have an office, a kitchen, a refrigerator, air conditioning and heat, 20 gallons of fresh water, a bathroom, a shower, an outdoor shower, a large bed, and plenty of storage. It comes with a screen door, an electric awning, and even a generator for when I'm off grid and need power. It's perfect. The only problem? The van is in Florida, and I had less than a week before my next job started. So I packed up everything that I owned into five bags. Four camera bags, a bag of clothes, and a computer. I produce TV shows for a living, like the one you're watching now. I direct, shoot, and edit everything, so I need a ton of camera gear to pull that off. The first few weeks in the van, I had an insane production schedule. I had six episodes to make in six different states and only 18 days to finish. The route took me from Florida to Louisiana, up to Illinois, through Iowa, Utah, and finally Nevada. On the last day of production, my van had its first major breakdown in Las Vegas. I found myself stuck, burnt out already, melting in the desert heat, and questioning my life choices. It took three weeks to get the parts I needed for the van, but finally, for the first time, I was back on the road and free to explore. This state park has been on my list for a while, only an hour and a half northeast of Las Vegas, the Valley of Fire. I grew up on the East Coast, and before this nomad lifestyle, I spent the better half of a decade at the beach. So I never got to spend any real time in the desert. This landscape feels so alien to me, like another planet. But there's something magical about it. The colors, the scale, the texture, and the stillness. When I first got to the Valley of Fire, I spent most of my days exploring and playing with my camera, going on hikes to scout out new places for time lapses. Attempting to climb rocks, taking pictures of rocks. I don't know, I like rocks. And there's really nothing here but rocks. One of my favorite things to do is to use social media to find popular photography spots at the places I visit, like this road. Most people stand on this rock with the road in the background, framed by mountains on all sides, and it's a classic and beautiful photo. But what I like to do is to take time to look around, to hike, explore, and to figure out how I can get a different angle and perspective on these popular places like this. All right, so we are in the Valley of Fire State Park in Nevada. Campsite is that way, the van's that way. I'm thinking that tonight I might go out and do uh, some astrophotography. Astrophotography is the art of capturing images of the night sky. It requires timing, planning, and a little bit of knowledge. We are able to use the camera's ability to gather light over extended period of time to observe and see what the human eye cannot. From my first attempt at this unique art form, I was hooked. But my goal is to get on top of that uh, and then to repeat the process tonight if I find anything good up there. There's some rams. <laughs> One, two, three, four rams. All right, we're gonna go this way. I mean you no harm, rams. Surrounded by all these beautiful rocks, but what I'd like to do is go up there. I'm thinking it'll be good because the higher elevation, we'll get to see more of the sky in the top of these rocks. So here's the view. That night, in the dark, I repeated this hike. It was terrifying. 
I started taking a time lapse of the stars moving across the sky, but I was interrupted by the most beautiful orange moonrise I've ever seen. And this is still one of my favorite photos I've ever taken of the night sky. After playing in the desert for a week, I had to get back to Las Vegas to pick up some very special guests. My whole family was flying out from the East Coast for our first trip to the Grand Canyon. And the best part was, it was my mom's birthday, so I had to get the van ready for the party. Happy birthday! It's your birthday. 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 Alright, happy birthday. Happy birthday. Feel string. Oh. 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 Couldn't go check out the Hoover Dam. The bridge overlooking the Hoover Dam is extremely high. It's almost 900 feet tall. I'm not a huge fan of heights. I'm working on it, but my mother's fear of heights is next level. So I was just impressed she was standing on the bridge. You want to come up here to the edge? It looks real. You get a better view back here. <laughs> see? Woo, you, can, you can see more of it from back here. I'm just hanging out. 900 feet above certain depth. So, with everybody crammed into the van and all of our luggage, we traveled six hours northeast to the Grand Canyon. Alright, so we just made it to the Grand Canyon, hiking down this road to a point where we're going to see the Grand Canyon for the very first time, and I'm excited. Who's excited? Woo! Yep, we're excited. That's crazy. Everybody remember the rule. What is the mother rule? Stand well away from the edge. Well, the Grand Canyon definitely lived up to the hype. It's like a reverse mountain range. Instead of climbing up to the top to get some great views, all you have to do is walk right up to the edge. And the only thing you can do is stop and marvel at the size and scale of this place. I loved getting to share these moments with my family and sharing a moment to slow down and enjoy a sunset. No brakes. For the next few days, we explored the South Rim on two wheels and four legs. I love getting to travel around to take pictures of our nation's best views. I believe it's important to preserve and to protect these lands. But there is a national no drone policy at both the state and national parks. And I get it. If we allow drones, there would be a hundred in the air at all times and the peaceful sounds of nature would be lost forever. But as a photographer, it is a bit of a bummer because these are some of the most beautiful landscapes that exist in our country. And using a drone is such a powerful tool. Adding altitude to your shots is one of the best ways you can add depth and scale. So unless you're a video editor with advanced knowledge of 3D rendering to simulate drone footage, the only way you can capture views in these protected parks is from the ground, unless you get creative.
getting to fly over one of the great wonders of the world was a dream come true. This was way better than any drone shot I ever could have gotten. And getting to share this with my family is one of the moments that I will never forget. And huge shout out to my mother. Because even with her fear of heights, she put on a brave face and jumped in for the ride of a lifetime. All right, Trey, what was your favorite part of the Grand Canyon? Probably Burt Reynolds, my mule. He the, was pretty awesome. The mule? Yeah, he was pretty awesome. All right, Mom, what was your favorite part of the Grand Canyon trip? Um, probably for me, just the North Rim and us all sitting around in the lodge at night, yeah. eating and playing, playing games. Like games. Yeah. For me, that was my favorite part. My favorite was definitely the helicopter. Mm -hmm. uh, super cinematic. Looks like we're getting some rain. What was your favorite part of the Grand Canyon? Uh, definitely seeing the view from the helicopter. For me, that was definitely the best. Yeah. Just watching it kind of, like I looked down at, as we came up on the edge and just watching it drop. Yes. Was just amazing. And yeah. so many good views of the road. Favorite part of the Grand Canyon trip? Um, definitely the, the helicopter, no. The bikes, the day we rode, no, the mules were, no, the helicopter was, it was all good. It was amazing. The north rim, so the south rim was really, was really great and had lots of great views. Failing. Hold on. We interrupt this for a weather announcement. Life can be scary. Storms can come out of nowhere. They catch us unprepared and at the worst of times. And sometimes all we can do is hold on tight and weather it out. Storms are scary and unpredictable, but they exist to make us stronger. Raging winds help root us in purpose. Thunder and lightning illuminate our path, guiding us through the darkness. Just remember the promise of the calm. The sun will shine again. And oftentimes the best sunsets come after the storm. During life's toughest times, the best thing you can do is surround yourself with good people. And my family is good people. They helped me survive one of the worst storms in my life. And when I decided to give this crazy nomadic life another try, they were all supportive. And I'm so grateful that they got to come out and travel with me and experience just a little taste of this lifestyle. After I dropped my family off at the airport in Las Vegas, I was finally ready to go on my first big solo adventure. Just over a two hour drive northeast is one of the most visited national parks in the country. Just across the Utah state line is Zion National Park. Immediately, I could see why Zion was so popular. It's a deep green valley surrounded by hundreds of feet of bright orange sandstone cliffs. It's truly breathtaking. One of the things I love about solo traveling is how much you can learn about yourself. Navigating the challenges of the world on your own exposes both your strengths and your weaknesses. One of my weaknesses is planning and preparation. I only had a few days to spend at Zion, and I showed up without a plan. And that's when I found out the only way to navigate the park is through their shuttle system, which has limited operating hours, ruining my plans of finding a sunset hike. But after doing my research, I showed up bright and early the next day, planned, prepared, and extremely excited. There are over 100 hikes in six different sections of the park, but I was after one hike in particular, Angel's Landing. After taking the shuttle to the sixth stop, you cross a bridge to the trailhead, 
This hike is only a five mile out and back trail, but don't let that fool you. From the valley floor to the top is over 2,000 feet of elevation and it takes about four hours to complete. And halfway through this hike, you face a 250 foot wall of 21 switchbacks. That's the equivalent of climbing a 25 story building. Then the hike continues on a razor's edge all the way to the top. At 1400 feet above the valley floor and some spots being only three feet wide, it's clear to see why this hike is considered one of the most dangerous in all the national parks. One of the reasons I like hiking is for the challenge. Taking a bag full of cameras up a mountain is not easy, but getting to capture these landscapes is so fulfilling and brings me so much joy. Being out in nature gives me the opportunity to stay active, to unplug, and to enjoy a great view. While I was looking over the Zion Valley, I started to reflect on how that hike felt a lot like life. Because the path to the top of Angel's Landing is long, difficult, and terrifying. And sometimes life can feel the same way. So we were raised to follow the path. From schools, to jobs, careers, families, and even retirement, just follow the path. Generations have gone ahead of us, put up signs for us to follow, built stairs, and even paved parts of the path for us. They put up safety chains for us to hold on to, to help guide us to the top. Just stay on the path. And to be honest, there's absolutely nothing wrong with this path. It can be challenging and fulfilling and might be everything you're looking for. But for generations, we've seen the same picture from the same view at the top. And while it's a beautiful view, I don't want my pictures to look like everyone else's. So that's what this borderless life is for me. It's a way for me to get off the beaten path and to go out and find new ones discovering new perspectives by learning from others, finding new adventures in new places. I don't know where this path will take me, but I'm excited to share all the new pictures I capture along the way. Next time on Becoming Borderless, I meet up with my first van life couple in Albuquerque, New Mexico for the International Balloon Festival.